We're going to study uh, something that we do around the same time each year as Hanukkah comes, comes about. Hanukkah means dedication. And uh, it's an important, I believe, an important festival, not only because it's something that we see uh, that Jesus himself participated with in Scripture, and for me that's an important thing. I don't believe Jesus went about doing religious activities for the sake of it. He was a Torah observant Jew. He did the different feasts and the festivals and, 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 and that we see. But it seems interesting to me that he went to Jerusalem for the feast, the festival of lights. He did it on purpose. And so there's, for me, that, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It kind of justifies or solidifies that this is something that we should give our attention to, plus the, the history that surrounds it, that enables us to understand uh, what was happening just a a century and a half before Jesus was born. It's important for us to look at it. And so uh, as Hanukkah is coming up, uh, the first Hanukkah candles will be lit, I believe, Tuesday evening coming up this week. Uh, And uh, as many of us go into the city to celebrate with the the Jewish people uh, next Sunday evening, uh, which will be a number of days into into Hanukkah, I believe that this will this year have a a depth of meaning and understanding for you, perhaps more than you've ever had before. Praise God! So let's let's turn to Leviticus chapter twenty-four, and let's read what God said concerning uh, these things. Hallelujah! We're going to learn about what God said concerning the supply of oil that was to be lit and kept burning before him. Leviticus chapter 24 verses 1 through 4 says this, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. Outside the veil of the testimony, in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning, before the Lord continually. Shall be a statute forever in your generations, and he shall be in charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. Hallelujah. Now, um, Mark, do we have a picture of a, of a menorah that we can put up? Is there the, do you have the one with the, the gold menorah from Jerusalem? Is that in there? or is, I think that was in the PowerPoint there. Um, if you've been to Jerusalem, you certainly would have seen this in a, in a glass case uh, up in the Jewish quarter, um, looking down to the western wall over there to the left. Uh, this is the Temple Institute uh, have made, remade this gold menorah. Uh, which would, houses the oil and the lamps. It's a replica of what would have been in the original uh, temple. Um, and so the oil was pressed, but it's interesting to see here that it was a command to the children of Israel that they bring the pure oil of pressed olives. They, they, this was supplied through uh, the supply of the children of Israel. So, so each family had a, a participating part in this lamp being continually lit. And the oil was brought and it was consecrated, it was set apart and it would go in there and Aaron and his sons had the job of looking after this and there was supposed to be that light that was continually burnt, uh, you know, forever. Um, can you imagine, can you, I want you to imagine being Jewish for a second. Imagine, imagine that you're Jewish. I'm not asking you to be Jewish. I think that's where some people have tried to miss things. They get, get excited about Judaism and, and learning about it and understanding it, and that's why we spend a lot of time here. But the, the goal is not to try to get people to become Jewish. That would be missing the point. Uh, the goal is to reconcile people to God and the Jewish people were given and continually have a covenant with God that is uh, for them to be light bearers of His Word and to, to maintain and keep the oracles of God. But imagine for a moment that you are Jewish. Imagine that your family has been, you know, a, a part of the seed of Abraham from generation to generation to generation to generation, and that you believe that God is the Lord God. You believe, and daily you say the Shema, Shema Israel, Adonai Lechenu, Adonai Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You believe this for all of your life, and, 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 but you're living in a day in which there is no temple. The very central uh, focus 
of the Jewish life. There is no sacrifice that's taking place. There's not even a, a, a lamp that's allowed to... In fact, if you were to personally go to Jerusalem, the very place where that temple was, you wouldn't even be allowed up on the Temple Mount to pray. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine that the, in, your, in your soul, in your spirit, in your heart, the, the, the constant desire to worship God and yet that, the restriction of never being able to in the prescribed manner? Can you imagine that? Now, now, you and I, as people who believe in Jesus, God has, has taken us within the veil, by the Spirit, into His presence. He supplied the oil. He supplied the light. He supplied the sacrifice through Jesus. He supplied all of this for us. And so now we become living temples of the Holy Spirit, and we're able to come into the presence of God. And there's, no, there's no one throwing stones at us when we enter into His presence. <laughs> Praise God for that. But, but let that parallel, let that charge you to continue to pray for those precious Jewish people around the world and, and pray for Jerusalem. Pray for the peace, the shalom, the coming together of, of Jerusalem, the wholeness of all that that means. Praise God. So we see that the, the prescription of, of this oil is supposed to be uh, each family, each the children of Israel, bringing their supply. Now you remember, God uh, said to me, and we'll get to this towards the end of this message, again, that you are to consider your supply. What's your supply? What did you bring this morning to church? Can I, can I just say this, folks? Church is not a spectator activity. Uh, it, you know, there's no difference between the pulpit and the pew in terms of the demand on your supply every time we come together. Now, my, my, the pulpit ministry has a, 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 maybe a different supply in terms of what I'm supposed to do, in the, and the pew has a different supply in terms of what you're supposed to do on the Sunday, but there's no demand, there's no difference on the demand for it. You don't come in, plonk yourself down and say, well, let's see what he has to say today. <laughs> ah, let's see if I agree with him or not. Oh, whatever. You know. No, there, you should be pulling on the anointing of God. You should be pulling on the Word of God. Do you know how easy it is to preach when people are pulling on that anointing? I've been in environments where it's not been the case. Honestly, it was like... It, it was, you know, you preach and you preach and you preach and you think you're about 45 minutes into it. And you look at your watch, it was five minutes. It was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like pulling teeth. And people are staring at you. It's like, and you're looking at them and you're thinking, why are you here? <laughs> now, I can't say I've ever experienced that. In the 12 years, nearly 12 years of this church being in existence, I can't say I've ever, ever experienced. I've felt, and I've, I've come to church feeling like, man, I've got not a whole lot to give sometimes. I've got a word from the Lord, but, you know, tired or empty or whatever. But, but then I get amongst you and there's this draw on the anointing and, it, and there's always, God always shows up, you know, because it's not my responsibility to teach you. You understand that? It's my responsibility to pray. It's my responsibility to study. It's his responsibility to give me the word for you. It's my responsibility to deliver it to you, but it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to be your teacher. Amen. And so that's a whole load off my, my shoulders. Praise God. And, and so, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, yet we go deep. Sometimes we, we get some pretty meaty stuff and we chew it. But I remember there was one time I was preaching a message and I thought to myself, halfway through, I, honest, I, I was preaching it and I thought, Man, this is, this is pretty solid stuff. And I noticed there was a few visitors in, uh, in church that day, and I thought, wow, I hope, I hope they're handling this okay. This is pretty meaty stuff, you know. And, uh, and uh, it was actually the day then that, that a young lady came forward and gave her life to the Lord. And I think at the end I was thinking, my, you know, that, what a message. And she, you know, and she said, you know what she said to me? She said, everything you said, it was like it was just for me. So isn't it amazing that the Holy Spirit has no limitations? He's able to take a message and it'd be it, it, for some person to say, man, that was, a, that was advanced stuff, that was meaty stuff, that was, that was really you know, top shelf in the Spirit. Another person can just brand new, uh, just meeting the Lord for the first time and think the whole thing was for them. The, that's the Holy Spirit. That's what He does with it. 
Praise God. We never want to limit it. So we come here and we, we want to be conscious of our supply. Conscious of our supply. Bless the Lord. And so we come to what is called in the Bible, in the New Testament, the Festival of Lights. Isn't it interesting that, that the, the, the New Testament is what actually is the main historical document that is known by people today, unless you, you know, read Maccabees, uh, but the main historical document around the world that confirms the Jewish celebration of Hanukkah. Praise the Lord. That's a good thing. All right, so somebody might say, well, why should we as a church study Hanukkah? Uh, it's not even a commanded festival of the Lord. Well, that's true. But there are a couple of reasons. I want to just quickly give them to you. What ensued ensured the historical and spiritual environment into which Yeshua, Jesus, was to be born. So literally just a decade and a half out from Jesus' birth, if this, what we're about to talk about, had not taken place, there would have been no temple. There would have been no uh, Jerusalem. There would have been no Jewish people in, in Jerusalem. They would have either been killed or assimilated into the Greek way of life, and so they would have, it would have not been possible for the Messiah to have come, and if the Messiah had not come, what would that have meant for us? We would have been born without the hope of any salvation. So I'm glad that this, what we're about to take about, talk about just uh, took place only a, day, uh, a century and a half before Jesus was born. Uh, Jesus himself, as we've talked about, celebrated this festival. So to me, it was not just an empty religious activity. If Jesus went to Jerusalem on purpose to celebrate the festival of lights, then there had to be uh, a purpose in it. And uh, for me, that, you know, people have played with whether or not the, the certain miracles took place, which we're going to talk about. I believe, I believe it did. I believe it, it was genuine, and I believe that Jesus went there, uh, and it's confirmed in the New Testament because of that. Uh, the third reason, it exemplifies and reminds us of the courage that Israel and the Jewish people had to stand in over the centuries. And it alerts us to never, ever, ever allow that kind of anti-Semitism to be part of our lives. Not a part of our lives, not a part of those around us. But you know, it is, it, it is trying to prevail in our society. It's trying to prevail. And of anywhere in the world you would think that this would be resisted, but has, has, uh, has reared its head and is trying to make strong advancement again throughout Central Europe. It's, it's, it's astonishing to me. But I was talking to a Jewish man not that long ago, and uh, he was, you know, for, you know, he's lived next door to his next door neighbor for quite a long time, and they were chatting and stuff. And anyway, and he just happened to mention something about a Jewish, family. and they said, "Are you Jewish?" Like that? Are you Jewish? He said, "Yes." <laughs> and they walked up. Somebody he'd known for a long, long time, and and, and it's demonic. There's no rational sense. To, to, to look upon a religion or a, a, a people, a, 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 an investment of God into a people on the planet. There's no rational sense why anybody would think that way about that people. A people that have done more for this planet and more for the advancement of science, more for the advancement of health, more for the advancement of peace and everything else than any other person, people on the planet per capita. And yet people are marching in the streets for the people, the very other people who are trying to destroy and murder and um, there's no rational sense. So we can understand that, that anti-Semitism is not just a philosophy or a mindset, it is a demonic stronghold. Yes. There's no other way to explain it. It is a demonic stronghold. So for us as church, we have a part to play. We have a supply in taking our stand. When I came out of Yad Vashem in, in Jerusalem, the uh, place of the Holocaust Museum, uh, I, I, I think I've said to you before, I was expecting to be a mess when I was walking through there. I mean, it's very emotional. You know, just the, you see the children's shoes from the, from the gas chambers and all sorts of things. But I didn't. I, I thought I'd be an absolute... I thought I'd just be crying buckets, but I didn't. The longer I spent walking around that, and you, you need hours and hours to go around, the longer I spent walking around seeing the images and hearing, reading the stories and, and seeing the physical evidence, 
I, the stronger the resolve, I just, a stronger resolve. This must never happen again. And, and so that has stirred me. And this is what, in some ways, fuels what I, what I share when we come to Hanukkah each time. What are, the, what are the origins of the modern Hanukkah observance? Well, in the Talmud, uh, uh, Shabbat 21b, it talks about the miracle of one day's worth of oil lasting for eight days in the Temple Menorah. Uh, now, the Temple Menorah itself, as you can see, only has seven candlesticks, seven branches to it. But the Hanukkah Menorah has eight. The, uh, this, is the, this is the Temple one. But over the years, the uh, story of Hanukkah uh, is elaborated. So the, ha- the Hanukkah, it's not, people, sometimes people call them a Hanukkah menorah. Tem- technically, it's just a Hanukkah. It's not really a menorah. Um, it's, it, it, it is. It's the lamp, which is what, kind of what that means. But um, the, the eight-branched candlestick, do we have the picture of the eight-branched one that, uh, if, we, if we have that, there we go. So you can see there, there's, there's eight there, plus there's a central one which is um, the servant candle. The servant candle. Uh, shamash, I think, if I can remember the, the term. Uh, you see there. Um, now, Chanuk means to dedicate. Chanukah means it's a dedication. Um, and so you see the servant candle, which is the one that is used to light, to light the eight. And it just st- sits just a little higher than the other one. So the, the servant light... It lights all of all of the candles, so it's it brings this beautiful light. And of course, every Shabbat, uh, the candles are lit again to introduce that light into the house. Uh, and this is a similar a similar sentiment uh, for Hanukkah. But the what what is taught from the Talmud is that there was a miracle. One day's worth of oil lasted for eight days. We can look into the significance of that in a moment. The uh, Apocrypha, which uh, contained in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the, of the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, the Latin Vulgate, the original King James Bible when it was first put together, and modern Catholic Bibles. Catholics, interestingly, still have that con- connected in there, which is funny to me where throughout the Catholic history where they've been anti-Semitic at times, they've got so much of this stuff in their Bibles, well, well, the problem was the people weren't allowed to read the Bibles. Um, and what, so what we have in there is uh, one and two Maccabees. Some of you have heard that term before. A few years ago, I did a whole play on words, and I called them the Jewish brave hearts, and because it, Maccabees, it just sounds Scottish, but it's not. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> there's two two uh, uh, two Maccabees. There's what first Maccabees is the factual. Uh, descriptives of what took place. Second Maccabees is the theological perspective. Uh, they're written by two different unknown Jewish authors, uh, but they've been compiled, but they give us a wonderful uh, depth of history of what actually took place. And like much of the world at the time, Israel had been uh, conquered by Alexander the Great. So this is going back to a few centuries before Jesus now. Um, Alexander the Great, interestingly enough, was for the most part actually quite a benevolent uh, dictator, if you can have such a thing. I mean, he, you know, he, he conquered the world, but actually allowed, in most places, allowed people to continue life as normal, worship as normal, and so forth. He just wanted to be their ruler. Um, and, you know, of course, did that by force, but, but it allowed them to pretty much continue life uh, as normal. Uh, in culture and religion and so forth. But after his death, uh, Alexander's kingdom was divided into four regions and the Jews fell under a particular control of the Seleucids in Syria. Now, Syria, you know that term because you've heard it mentioned many times in the news of late. Uh, And so the Seleucids in in the Syrian empire there uh, were the the part of the Greek empire that was split into, into four. A hundred years after Alexander died, about 165 BC, a man named Antichus Epiphanes ruled over the Seleucid Greeks, uh, Syria. And over a period of time, he began to outlaw the Jews from being able to do any of their cultural or religious activities. He, he, he banned the Jews from temple worship. He banned them from all temple activities, actually. 
Um, he banned them from the Sabbath. He banned the Jewish weddings. So anybody that got married in the Jewish community had to do it underground, had to do it quietly, silently, and so forth. Uh, uh, um, and then it kind of climaxed into a genocidal attempt to wipe out the Jewish nation from existence. Basically, you were given two choices, convert or die. Now, so really, it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's either death or assimilate away from Judaism into, into the Greek culture. Now, it, it seems bizarre and almost unbelievable to our natural minds, uh, almost like something that we're talking about thousands of years ago, that the same kind of choice is being given to Christians in the Middle East. It, you either convert or you die. And of course, many of our brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in Christ, have chosen, I'd rather die than deny Jesus. And we need to continue to lift them up before the Lord. As, uh, uh, you know, not forget this. It's too easy for it just not to be in the news one day. And yet it's still going on. And we need to continually pray for them and lift them up. Bless the Lord for giving us the power of prayer. Amen. And so there's this genocidal attempt to wipe out the Jewish nation, either by, by, by death or by assimilation. Uh, it was called Hellenization. Um, it, Hellenization is, is the, uh, the uh, assimilation to the Greek way of thinking. Um, and so the, the Jewish worldview, of course, of life has always been in contrast. It's been a, it's been a very different worldview to every other culture on the planet, especially in those days. It stood out quite, quite uh, starkly. Um, the historical accounts from the book of Maccabees show us that some of the Jewish men desired to make an uh, alliance with the Gentiles. So actually within the Jewish ranks themselves, they perpetuated this Hellenization by trying to make an alliance uh, with the Greeks, with the Gentiles. And of course that didn't go down uh, well. It just made, exam, uh, exasperated the situation. Antichrist Epiphanes authorized an introduction to a, a, what he called a way of living of the Gentiles. And this was what was presented to them. This is the way the Gentiles live in. And this is something you can adopt in your Jewish way of life. Now think about this. Think about the similarities of this, even for you and I as Christians in today's world. Is there pressure from the world's way of thinking and the worldly life to assimilate and just do it like the world does it? Oh my goodness, every day. Is there ever a day when the world is not trying to put pressure on you and I, on our kids at school, on you in the workplace to, to assimilate and just slide on over there into the world's way of thinking? Well, what does Romans chapter 12 says? It says, uh, uh, view, you know, in, in view of God's mercies, therefore, offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. You know, there's a, de there's a certain dedication that we need to understand uh, to be a living sacrifice. You know, it, says, it precedes that, but it says, do not, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, see, we don't want to be conformed, but we want to dedicate ourselves to what God has called us to do and to be. And the pressure from the world right now to assimilate, the pressure from the world to just allow things to happen. You know, it, it, the enemy's strategy is to wear you down, to wear the church down. And in most nations, uh, if, when you consider things like, uh, like marriage, for instance, globally, the enemy has managed to wear the church down, nation after nation after nation, until they give up. Uh, just too much work, continuing to fight in the parliament, and eventually they subside and allow uh, homosexual marriage to take place. But folks, homosexual marriage is not the be-all and end-all of the campaign that, that, is, that is being placed. This is not just the homosexual lobby that's behind this. You understand. There is a perverted mindset that's behind that. And I, I'm aware that I'm being recorded right now and this will be on YouTube. I don't care. I don't. Because it's, it's not just that. There is a perverted mindset that's, that's behind it. Listen, I, I, I know homosexual people. 
They're precious people who are hurting, who, who are looking for love, just like anybody else on the, on the planet. Uh, and then there's all sorts of reasons and, and, and ways in which why people go in the, in the ways that they do. But at the end of the day, the Father, our Father God, wants us to understand a true love that's not, that's not sidelined into other, other strange ways. You know, and, and the push behind it is not just about homosexual marriage. There is a push. There is all sorts of things that are taking place, including pedophilia and, and all sorts of other things. I won't even mention to you from the pulpit. It's a slippery slope, folks. And let me just tell you something. I'm proud of this nation of Australia that it has not gone that way yet. It's so far. And I've sent a letter to every senator and every member of parliament, an email I should say, not that long ago, uh, outlining my, my, stand, my stance and, and requesting them not to back down and requesting the Liberal Party not to succumb to what they call a conscience vote, conscious vote. Based on a promise in the political campaign before the last elections. Now you can do whatever you like concerning that, but I would encourage you to do something similar. Because this nation hasn't bowed, hasn't bowed to that, that uh, perverted spirit. Well, we, we've taken a, st- a stance. What have we not done? We've not assimilated. And everyone's saying, oh, that's where the whole world, Australia's just behind the times. Ah, oh, no, 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 no. No, there's a continual blessing on the marriages of this nation because of a 1961 marriage act that declares that it marriages between one man and one woman for life. Amen. Praise God. Well, we're, we're glad of that. And, uh, and you know, my history, I've spoken to the state parliament about this and so forth. And it's a stance we'll continue, continue to take. But it's an example of assimilation. The world is trying to pull the church and Christians. And it, it could be a lot less and a lot more than that. <laughs> There's things on a daily basis. that Your workplace, maybe, just trying to pull you into some stuff. Just trying to get you to think. I have to speak to young Christian uh, people that I lecture in YWAM and, and, and that all the time. I have, to talk, I have to sit down and talk to them and get really straight with them. Because there's stuff, there's books and, and stuff that they're reading and, and I'll be straight with you. I, I'm getting their face about it because they don't have no idea what, what, why I would be, get onto them. And, and some of you, I'm about to maybe tread on your toes and upset some of you right now. But I get in their face and I say, Harry Potter is not okay. It is witchcraft. And not only is it, is it witchcraft, it, it is the, it, it, it's some, in some of those books apparently I haven't read them. Now you might say, well, you're a hypocrite. You haven't even read the books. I don't need, I don't need to read a book about a, a, that, that the, the, you know, we already know that it's a, a young man who goes to witchcraft college and within his training, he's, he's, they're trained in the dark arts. And by our own admission, the author of that book said that her purpose was to make each, each book in the series get darker and darker and darker. And so I, I speak to many young Christian people who are reading these books, have no idea, idea that there's anything wrong with it. I, I, I get in their face and say, it is not okay to mess with witchcraft. You've heard me give the, the dog poo analogy before, haven't you? Have you heard it? If you haven't heard it, let me give it to you. This is what I tell them. I say, if I came in with a big, lovely, beautiful chocolate cake and it all looked absolutely yummy and gorgeous and, and I cut you a slice and I said, oh, just before you eat it, just want to let you know it's just a little bit of dog poo in it. It's just nothing to worry about. It's only a little bit in there. Don't worry about it. It's just a tiny bit of dog poo. Just want to let you know, though. Would you eat the cake? Of course, everyone says, no way I would eat that cake. Well, it's the same thing. Just a little bit of witchcraft is not okay. That's right. It's not okay. There's an assimilation that that, that there's pressure on our Christian young people to try and pull them. I'm proud of our young people. I've watched them grow up. I've watched, uh, well, really, our our young adults now. Watch them grow up from from little ones. And we, so many of us, got together and started to know each other when they were in primary school. And watch the culture of honour and and uh, and and just just proud of them. Proud of them. The way they they live their lives. Hallelujah. I didn't intend to go off quite as much as I did on that, but that's all right. So, not long after the strategy against Israel and stopping them doing the things that they had to do as Jews, uh, the temple was desecrated and Jews were killed and plundered. 
and an altar to Zeus was placed there, and of, of all things, a pig was sacrificed in the Holy of Holies to defile it. Um, just as Daniel had prophesied years before about the abomination, desolation, and, and um, I believe we'll see a similar thing take place again in the future. We, you and I may not, maybe after we've left the planet, but um, within a few years, a decree was sent out that all uh, should be one people and leave their traditions. That, of course, again, anti-Semitic. That didn't really, wasn't really targeted anybody but the Jews. The king ordered the Jews to profane their Sabbaths, their Sabbath feasts, forget the Torah and change their observances. And it was, again, genocide by death or assimilation. During the attempt to put out the light of God on the earth, a priest named uh, Matathias or Matityahu slew a Hellenistic Jew. That's one of the Jews who had, who had wanted to take the people in a, into the Greek way of thinking. And he killed him. He stopped him. Because why? He was trying to offer a sacrifice to an idol. And he and his five sons fled to the wilderness of Judea. And after his death, about one year later, his son Judah, Maccabee, led a remnant army of Jews to a miraculous victory over the Seleucid dynasty. Now to understand this, now you may have looked at some of the historical battles that Israel has won, some of the recent histories and seen the miracles of the 67 war and so forth. Wonderful things, the Yom Kippur war. But this, you've got to understand, this was a thousand to one. Can you imagine the odds? A thousand well-trained, well-equipped soldiers with armoured elephants <laughs> against a ragtag bunch of young Jews who had been under oppression for many years. So they didn't really have the kind of weaponry or experience that these soldiers had. A thousand to one. That was the odds. At one stage, the opposing army, as I said, used armoured elephants. That'd be like tanks today. <laughs> Can you imagine? Not only an elephant coming charging at you. This thing's covered in metal. And, a, and horn on the front and so forth, big metal spike. When they entered Jerusalem, they set about cleansing and rededicating. Now, w w what happened? You've you got to understand, a thousand to one, but the, the Maccabees won. Battle after battle after battle, it intensified, and the, the Jewish Maccabees, these young, these young men, kept coming out on top, miraculously. It made no sense. The history books don't understand. It was just, it absolutely, it had to be God on their side. Had to be God on their side. Why? Why? Again, 150, 160 years later, Jesus is, about, is going to be born. <coughs> Jerusalem had to be there. The temple had to be there. And when they entered Jerusalem after this great battle, they set about cleansing and rededicating the temple and restoring the temple worship. But they discovered that there was only enough oil for one day of light from the temple, uh, the eternal light. It would take eight days to prepare some more oil, to, to set it, to make it, to consecrate it. It was going to take another eight days, but they only had one day, one day's worth. A miracle took place. Again, history books uh, don't record it. The Talmud ta uh, does. I believe, I believe it's genuine. Again, I believe why? Because Jesus went to, and the Bible in the New Testament says to celebrate the festival of lights. The whole reason it's called the festival of lights was because of this, this miracle of, of the oil. Had the Maccabees not dared to stand for the word of God against the assimil assimil to be assimilated into Gentile way of life, they would not have been a temple. And we should honour them for that. Romans 3, 1 and 2 says, What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. And through their ups and downs of history, we still have the word of God today in its purest form because of that stance, because of that entrusted oracle. So we continue to bless Israel. We continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We continue to stand with the Jewish people. The strategy of the enemy to wipe out the light of God from the world has arisen many times through history. I don't have to go into all the details about that with you from Russia to Germany to Spain to many other places around the world where the Jews have been constantly under pressure, killed. The reason there's only 
A few million Jews on the earth today is because about the same number was wiped out during the Second World War. And that doesn't affect just the six million. It affects the six million plus plus their potential children, their potential grandchildren, their potential great-grandchildren that don't exist. We, We can celebrate the coming of Messiah into this world And even though he wasn't actually born at this time of the year, I believe it's a good thing for us to celebrate that he was born as the Word made flesh. We can celebrate that in a a free world because of stances like this throughout history. Today the devil, the enemy of our souls, continues to try to put out the light. Why? Because God is light and in him there, there is no darkness at all. He doesn't want the light. He has to work in darkness. That's the, only, that's the only option he has. Light is the foundation of substance. Light is the basis of all matter on the planet. And God is the basis of that light. You and I work, walk, walk around in a world that is, is everything in it was created. Now some of it's been perverted, some of it's been twisted by sin, yes. But its origins, all of its creation came from that light, came from that word, came from God himself. Chanukah means dedication. When Chanuk is used in Proverbs 22 verse 6, train up a child or dedicate a child in the way it should go. It's the same word. Dedication is, and training uh, is for us to, to set ourselves apart to do and fulfill the work and the call of God. Our light, as Jesus said, it, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Our light has been given to us by God. When the temple was cleansed for worship, they removed the stones that had been defiled by the pig's blood. They could not just throw them away because they were dedicated stones, but they put them aside into a place called Solomon's portico. So that when, and this is the concept, they didn't know what to do with them. So they thought, well, let's put them aside in Solomon's portico and when the Mashiach comes, he'll know what to do with them. Well, you know what? Mashiach came. The Messiah came. And let's read this together in John chapter 10. I find this very interesting. In John chapter 10, verse 22, now it was the Feast of Dedication. This is is what we're talking about, the Festival of, of Lights. The Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Isn't it interesting that that Jesus heads straight for a particular place in the temple? And he goes to there, goes there for the feast of dedication. And he heads straight for Solomon's porch. Why? What's at Solomon's porch? There's a great pile of rubble there of the stones that were dedicated that had been defiled by the pig's blood. Jesus heads straight for that place. And the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you don't. Do not believe because you are not of my sheep as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Oh my goodness, they, that upset them. I mean that, that's, <laughs> that's the statement that, that they just couldn't tolerate. Jesus saying, I and the Father are one. Now, it's interesting what happened next. Then they took up stones again to stone him. Folks, I've got to tell you, they, they were not, they, the temple was kept clean. There weren't rubble lying around anywhere. This is the only place. And so the only stones that they could possibly pick up to throw <laughs> would have been these defiled stones. And they picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, many good works... I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered and said, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said, I'm the Son of God? 
If I do not do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. Anyway, Jesus just went, (laughs) slept over into the light. They're like, where'd he go? Where'd he go? (laughs) I love that. Did that a few times. Jesus in a very rare statement about himself. Very rarely did he ever call himself the Son of God. In fact, almost exclusively he said Son of Man. And even in this context, he was declaring that man, the, the, the man, that he has come as a man with the inheritance of the Godhead. Um, but here he said, he said Son of God. He referred to himself as such. But in such, he also was paving a way for there to not only be one Son of God, but there to be a family of sons of God. That he would be not ashamed to call us brethren and to bring us in so you and I can say, well, we are the sons of God collectively, corporately, individually. We are sons of God, have come into a relationship where the Father is our Father. (coughs) Excuse me, he's our dad. And Jesus was was forging the way for that. Now in the temple, as we go back in time again to the Maccabees, there was only one veil of oil. Only one veil of oil. You think about it, there should have been lots. There should have been a great supply of oil to keep the oil burning. All they could find was one. I want to challenge you with this thought for a moment. Sometimes in life... You can look around you and there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of things going on. And you might only think, man, I don't know if I have a whole lot to give. I don't know how, if I have a, a great, vast amount of supply. I just got this little bit. I just got this word that I'm holding on to. I got this, I got this sense of what God wants me to do or to say. I've got, I've got this church family that I'm connected to. I've got these Christian friends that I that I'm, I'm close to, but yeah, that's just a little bit. Of what, what is it really? Am I fooling myself? Is there something, is there really something that God can use me for? You know, maybe I should just sit down and keep quiet. No, folks, I want to encourage you. It was just the little bit of oil that made the difference. See, God's able to take your little supply and he's able to do miracles with it. Because at the end of the day, if he's given you his supply, if you've got a supply in you, it's not your supply that you're using anyway. If you've got a supply, it's because he gave it to you to start with. That miracle came from him in the first place. Now, not only did the oil last more than a day, it's interesting because it lasted eight days. Now, what is, why is that significant? Seven, in Hebrew thought, is, is, a, is, the, is the, the number that describes the natural order of things. There's seven days in a week. There's seven years in a Shemitah, uh, up to the Shemitah year. Seven, it's the natural order. After seven begins one again. But this lasted eight days. Now, now you and I, in a sense, are eighth day people because we will go into Uh, uh, the millennium, which is the Shabbat, which is the thousand year rule and reign of the Mashiach on the earth. And then we will step beyond the millennium into the eighth year, which is the first. So even when you go to the Feast of Tabernacles, that has a type or an explanation of that because you have an eight day, seven day festival, which lasts for eight days. (laughs) And it steps over into the eighth day on purpose because it's prophetically announcing what comes next the new heavens and the new earth, and, and this beginning again. Hallelujah. It's, di- it's called the eighth. It's the first, but it's the eighth because it's a continuation of a new beginning, if that makes any sense to you. Huh. God's not separated from what went before, but it's, it's brand new in its form. And so the oil, interestingly, lasted for eight days. It lasted its natural Seventh, and then of course, as soon as it gets into the eighth, it's a type and a, a, a shadow of a su- entering into the supernatural supply. The whole, the whole thing beyond the first day, really, you've got a, a, a one day's worth which is natural, but as, as it lasted another seven days beyond that, it, it ended over into the supernatural. Praise God. Recently, I was 
in a time of prayer for the leaders and volunteers of church, I mentioned this last week, and I heard the Lord say, encourage me with these words, consider your supply. To encourage them with these words, consider your supply. Consider your supply. And then he added further the words, joining rivers into a flood. And I, I've just sent out uh, our monthly ministry mail for December. If you're not on the email list, then, then let us know at the book table. We'll put you on, on there. Or you can just go to the website and sign up yourself. But I sent out a, a, a ministry mail with, with, with the, what I'm about to talk to you about next. It's just a little few minutes more just to start to inject into your heart for, for you to s- s- consider the supply that God's given you. I, I believe there's people sitting in church not necessarily this church, but church, church around the world. And they're sitting there and they don't know. They don't know the supply they've got. They're, they're discouraged, frustrated, heartbroken, some of them. Some of these people aren't even in church anymore because they're so disenfranchised. I believe it, God's saying again, it's time for us to encourage people, love people, help people step up. All of the as we ministered a few weeks ago, as Pastor Paul Brady ministered that word which we looked at with all of the false starts over the years, the, the times where it felt like we've not gotten anywhere. No. God wants you to consider your supply, consider what he's put inside of you. But you know, sometimes, sometimes what's happened is we've taken our supply and we've tried to do it on our own. But your supply, the anointing of oil of God, the rivers that you've got, were never supposed to flow by themselves. There's a corporate, there's a corporateness that comes, there's a blessing that comes with the unity that we come together in. And the enemy's strategy has been relentless and it's been ruthless in the last years. And we've even felt the effects of it in our own church, in our own church family over the years from time to time where the enemy's come in and tried to divide friend from friend and family member from family member and and the person uh, person behind you and beside you and, and so forth. There's been this relentless and ruthless strategy that the enemy's come in to try to divide Uh, people from one another. Why? It's not just about you not getting on with each other or upset with one another or or getting offended or for some other reason. It's all about stopping the flow. It's all about stopping the supplies coming together. That's what the enemy is trying to limit. In the book of Daniel, looking forward to the end of days, We're told in Daniel chapter 7, 25, and he shall speak words against the Most High God. And listen to this. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change the time. The enemy's strategy uh, for Israel will, will be to wear them down. It is certainly for the church right now to wear us down. To wear us down on our stance of morality in what we call uh, and bring to a place of law in Australia, to, br- to wear us down in our personal morality. What, what you're doing and what you're looking at when no one else is looking. Folks, we have to step up and allow God's love, His grace, His power, His sufficiency be, be there for us to overcome these things and to walk through these things. But more than that, I believe God wants his, that same supply and that power to be coming, flowing through you to stand with another brother and sister to help them stand. In the book of Revelation, we see that these precious saints do indeed stand. How do they stand? Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him. So we're talking about the same season, the same time that Daniel's looking forward to. They overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not their own lives even unto the death. So some of these precious saints in our future will be martyred, will be killed. But that means nothing to this statement because the statement is they are they are already overcomers by the blood and the word, and they don't doesn't matter. They don't even love their lives. That, what can you do to me? You can't do anything to kill me. Ha ha ha! What does that mean? I can't die. You might stop my body from not, from living, but that just enters me into more life than I've ever known in my entire natural life. Amen. Praise God. And the truth is for us right now, Jesus is still Lord. The Father is still Almighty. The Holy Spirit is still the guarantee. Yes. God has not changed. 
His word, his word and He will never change. We've got to stop striving in the flesh. We've got to stop, stop trying to do our little bit by ourselves. We've got to let that supply flow. But you've got to consider what you've got. Consider your supply. Consider the anointing. Consider the words. Consider the investment. Consider the things that God has spoken to you over the years. Is it flowing? Is it available? For me, as your pastor, to draw upon. For the person sitting next to you, to minister to them. Is it available? Is it locked up? Is it held back? Is it flowing? Because the next thing he said was rivers, uh, into, rivers to a flood. There's supposed to be a, the rivers that come out of each one of us. Jesus said that the rivers, that, that there's a rivers of living water are supposed to flow out of us. But it, it, if my river flows into this, it'll just be a wet patch on the ground. But if all of our rivers flow together, it'll fill up this room and to a flood tide that anybody walking in is going to be just enveloped by. That's what it's talking about. So we walk in the streets yesterday, putting these things in letterboxes and praying in the Spirit. You know, and as we, as we get these calls for these Bibles, what is that about? It's about us reaching out into this community to let our supply go. What was my supply yesterday? Walking. As that was it. My supply yesterday was walking and praying and, and letterbox dropping. That was my supply. And so we, we did it. Amen. Praise God. What's your supply today? What did you bring to church? What's the oil that God wants to turn into a miracle? What's he put inside of you? Consider your supply. Joining rivers to a flood. Joining rivers to a flood. But it comes, it comes and it's powerful by what every joint supplies. Um, let's quickly go to the scripture, last scripture, Ephesians 4.16. And this is where we see it. Your part, whatever it was, whatever it is, whatever it will be, was never designed solely for your benefit. It was designed to flow through you to minister to others. What is that supply? Ephesians 4.16 says, from, the, from whom the whole body, the whole body, joined and knit together by what? By what every joint supplies. It's, it's, it's the joint that supplies. You know, this, you know the scriptures. One can put a thousand to flight. But two, what? 10,000. That's an exponential, exponential growth of capacity. I mean, that makes no sense to the mathematical mind. One equals a thousand. Two then equals what? Two thousand. No, no. God says no, two equals ten thousand. Huh? It's, 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 it's gone beyond the seventh day. It moves beyond the, the one day of all. It moves beyond the natural. It moves into the new. It, we're crossing over into, into the new. We're crossing over into the supernatural. We're crossing over, folks, into what, what your supply and my supply. My supply by itself will do powerful things because God gave it to me. And your supply by itself will do powerful things because God gave it to you. But if you and I put our supply together... It's exponential what will happen. And this is why the enemy will constantly come in and try to bring division in the church, between churches, within churches. He's, he's managed to shut down whole churches. Why? Because the enemy cannot allow us to bring our supplies together. That's all over, Red Rover, if that happens. And let me tell you something. We are not going to go out of here in strife with one another. When we, when, we, when we meet the Lord Jesus in the air, it will be in a blaze of glory. If you want to flow in your supply, you want to activate your supply, then you just simply put on the glory of God. And that glory, touching each person as each person puts on that robe of righteousness and allows the glory of God to flow, your supply, touching my supply, touching someone else's supply, starts to rise up in a room as a, as a flood tide. Let me tell you something. We're about to see days where we will see miracle. We will see healings that you've heard about. I heard recently someone say, if, 
If, uh, now I'll see if I can remember it. See if I remember it accurately. It was a very, very good statement. If your, if the memories you have are more exciting to you than the future, then you're facing the wrong direction. If, in other words, if you, if, if all you, if what you talk about is the good old days and wow, wasn't that amazing? Wasn't that amazing? And thinking about the miracles of old and the miracles that to, took place, if that's more exciting than you, than, than, than your future, then you're looking in the wrong direction. Because those things are supposed to fuel us from behind to move forward and to press toward the mark of the high call in Christ Jesus. So what's ahead of us is going to be spectacular. What's ahead of us is going to be miraculous. What's ahead of us is going to be glorious, folks. But it's not going to happen because I step up as a minister of the gospel to go ahead and do what I'm called to do and you go ahead and do what you're called to do individually. It's going to be because as a body, it's not, it's not going to be the, 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 how can I put it? I, I believe I'm seeing in, in our future as a church, it's not going to be personality driven. It's not going to be uh, the, 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 the figureheads that God has had to use in the past to lead us. There's going to be a corporate, there's going to be something new. There's a corporate nature in which God is calling us to be and to do. And it's going to be a move of the Spirit across that sweeps across this nation, across this earth, like we've, it exceeds anything we've read about. I believe it with all of my heart. I believe it with all of my heart. We have to take our eyes off what we can see in the natural because some of the greatest pressure, the greatest obstacles and the greatest discouragements happen on purpose just before the greatest victories. If, you feel, if you're feeling like, if you've ever had this thought recently, man, I'm not sure how much I can take. I'm not sure if I want to keep going on in this. If that's the thought then I'm excited about that. Because if, that, if that's the place you got to, that's because of a reason. That's because that level of pressure is reserved for the moment before the breakthrough comes. Because the enemy has to. He, he reserves his greatest pressure to try to stop and divide and pull you back because he knows what is around the corner. And he doesn't know, he, he know it all in detail. He, he just knows when God's up to something. God's working on something. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want to encourage you folks. And I, as I said in my, in my, in my ministry mail, no, not me encourage. I believe the Lord wants to encourage you to consider your supply. Let, let's join rivers to a flood. Let's be a blessing to one another in this room. Let's, let's be ruthless with ourselves and never allow any kind of offense to come. Be quick to forgive. Quick to release. Quick to let it go. Let's be quick to pray for other churches, other den- denominations, other places. Be quick to bless. Be quick in these, in these areas. The, the, we, we don't have even a moment to hold on to anything that can bring division. That anointing oil ran down Aaron's beard, that, that anointing, you know, the blessing, that through unity, that's where it comes. That's what God's looking for. That's why in the upper room, God called them together. They'd been praying for days. It was on a specific day, Shavuot. God had ordained it. But they they were in that place of unity. And in that right moment, at that right time that God had planned, that unity that had been building and and, and, uh, and, and compounding was released. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God was able to move on their midst. Praise God. Consider your supply. Consider your supply. Consider the supply of the, those young Maccabee men. Consu- consider the miracle of that one vase of oil that they found. Consider what Jesus has done for you and me. Can, consider the supply of a baby lying in a manger 2,000 years ago. So that even today, even in this post-Christian, for a large degree, world, 
you can still go to a mall and that influence is still strong enough, that baby's influence is still strong enough that you can walk into Westfield Mall this afternoon and you can hear Jesus being sung about. Only happens once a year, but, <laughs> but that's, that's an amazing thing. Greatest evangelistic time of the year, I believe. Because, but because of that. You don't even have those songs at, 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 uh, around the Passover time, what the world calls Easter. You do it this, at this time of year. And so we make the most of it. Make the most of it, folks. And agree with me and believe with me that, that every single one of those flyers that we put out into those letterboxes is seen, is read. And we have many people phoning us up and asking or emailing us asking for the Word of God. We have many opportunities to go and pray and bless those households. Many opportunities to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Let's, let's, let, our, let's let our supply flow. Amen? Praise God. Father, we want to thank you for today. Thank you for the things we've learned today. Thank you for the, the inspiration of those Maccabees, of those young Jewish men that stood and fought and allowed, as they laid their lives down, a your miracle supply to be their sufficiency. To, to not stand and just be assimilated and wiped out in, in the pages of history, but to make a stand for your word, to make a stand for you. Let that inspire us, God, as we enter into and are in, I believe, these end of days, these times, these seasons. Father, let, let the miracle of that oil, lasting and going beyond the natural into the supernatural, let that be an encouragement, an exhortation into our hearts to be a people that goes beyond the natural, that it wakes up each day believing God to, that the, our supply and the supply of those around us will enable us to step up and step into things beyond the natural. God, that we will see miracles that we've never seen before. Healings. Healings in the name of Jesus right now. Thank you, Father. God, we thank you that you're releasing as we come together, releasing a flood tide of the supernatural, of the miraculous, of the glory of God. We thank you as we let our light shine at these festival of lights, as we let your goodness manifest through us. Father, we thank you for it. We receive it, we minister it, and we're looking forward to the testimonies of lives changed, eternities altered. In the name, the precious name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.